Hello and welcome to our ninth uh, webinar in the Complete COVID uh, series. And uh, today we're going to be talking about community culture and relationships. I just want to draw your attention, if I can, first of all, to um, the website and to the webinars that we've done so far in this series. We've already done um, eight and you can see them there. They're on our website and also um, you can hear them as podcasts um, and those are completely freely available on our website as well. We're getting a number of people asking, um, are we doing masterclasses and specific webinars for specific clients? So um, the answer to that is yes. So please get in touch if you're interested, just to draw your attention to one of them. The third webinar was about mental health strategies that work and don't work. There's a huge, vast number of resources in there that Alan went through in quite a short period of time. So please do go back and have a look either in the, the webinars or the, or the podcasts. Um, that would be really helpful and ask uh, your friends or colleagues to, to sign up for the series as well. Um, so as I said, the uh, topic today is community culture and relationships. Alan, um, welcome, looks sunny where you are. Glorious weather, something to really enjoy. <laughs> And um, so I want to dive straight in to, uh, to the topic today. We were, we were discussing this a couple of days ago and um, we were talking about the kind of five, five waves and, and discovered that there was one, one forgotten wave. Tell us a bit more about that. Uh, thank you, Katie. Yes. And hello to everybody. Uh, so when we started this webinar series, we did talk about the five waves and it was only in review that we realised we missed one. So just to remind people, um, the first wave of COVID was the, the health crisis. It's basically a lung infection, uh, but then there's the mental health and psychological dimension. So it was a health issue. Wave two was the fact that, you know, health systems will become easily overwhelmed. And so it was all about, the strategy was all about flattening the top of the curve, getting ventilators out, PPE, all of those sort of basic things to make sure the health system worked. Um, and then the economic impact, and we've talked a bit of, uh, over this series about um, you know the spike in unemployment, you know the likely you know rise in poverty around the world, and so on. Um, and then we talked about um, system change and unintended consequence. And of course, the wave we missed, uh, which we're going to talk about today, ironically, um, is sort of collaborative communities, you know, culture, uh, and all of those types of issues, uh, relationship essentially at the core relationship. So that's really the, the sort of uh, focus uh, today. Um, and in particular, the role of companies. Um, and interestingly, even the word company comes from the Latin companis or with bread. You know, so uh, when companies started to form, we used to sort of sit around and break bread with each other. Um, you know, uh, and um, that's the origin of the word company. So company was originally breaking bread. Um, and, uh, you know, which is why at the core, all companies are about people breaking bread with each other. Um, and the reason I'm particularly interested in, you know, the role of companies is uh, there's been an awful lot of noise in the media sort of globally uh, about the uh, contribution or lack of contribution or leadership or lack of leadership of political leaders, um, you know, uh, and... Um, uh, a lot of them are coming with some very heavy criticism, whether it's, you know, Boris Johnson in the UK, Donald Trump in the US, uh, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, or any of these leaders, uh, a sort of catalogue of uh, uninspiring uh, responses male. from many of these people. Uh, unfortunately, most of them male. Uh, in fact, some of the most inspiring responses, you know, Yacinda Ahern in, in New Zealand and some of the Scandinavian who have done better ironically, female leaders, um, you know, Angela Merkel, you know, perhaps some of the best data in Europe has come from Germany in terms of the response to the COVID crisis. So Scandinavia and Germany and New Zealand have done well, all led by women. But that's probably the, the, the subject of another whole webinar there, Katie. Mm, um, I think so. so but it's, it's an uninspiring, very, very male, male, pale, stale. Yes. Uh, but as I say, I, I, I don't disagree with that, but that's probably the subject of another topic. Um, so, you know, when you look at this and, and you see all the criticism of our political leaders, uh, it's difficult to escape the conclusion that actually um, we're not being well led politically. So it comes down to business. Uh, and what's interesting about that, and we've certainly seen this in our client base, 
is business have taken a much more enlightened uh, uh, approach to the uh, global pandemic, partly because they're multinational, whereas national political leaders take an ethnocentric view just about their country largely. Uh, so some of our clients, you know, uh, who have got offices in the Far East in China, uh, as soon as they started to get wind of there was this virus brewing, these clients ordered their own ventilators, their own PPE, their own testing kit and shipped it to Mexico, you know, and other parts of the world. So, you know, in many ways, uh, multinational companies are set up to respond to a global plan pandemic in a global way, whereas political leaders are set up to respond on a national level. So there's an interesting challenge. So it's part structural, you know, political leaders are set up to respond nationally and ethnocentrically, uh, multinationals are responding globally, but also the quality of leadership has been different. So I want to sort of drill in on that, particularly when we talk about uh, collaborative communities. Um, and, uh, you know, the hope for the future really is that business leaders will take a very different view moving forward. And that's what we're going to sort of talk about. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it sounds good. I know that some of the companies we work with are, are very, um, let's say, for the want of a better word, competitive mm. uh, and quite aggressive in that we're going to kill the competition and we're going to... Yeah, all of the, that. The, the so, narrative is, is, is quite sure, harsh. So, so I think we've got to, when we say, okay, well, if we're looking to business leaders rather than political or religious leaders to sort of save the planet, if you will, um, what's the narrative that they operate with? And um, there are there's a whole bunch of businesses that operate with a very excessive Darwinian approach to business and, you know, the future. Um, and so you do hear these phrases and you've certainly heard it through COVID, you know, these battle metaphors, it's a battle for survival and the thing that matters in business, we've just got to get beyond COVID, um, you know, and, you know, it has its roots in, you know, philosophies that GE used to extol back in the day. Uh, Kill the stragglers was a phrase that was often bandied around, which is the 10%, the bottom 10% of performers will just sack them every year. Um, and that, that sort of narrative in business is still very common. Uh, you know, it's a doggy dog world. It's every man for him and woman for himself, you know, and very much an us versus them mindset, you know, and this sort of highly simplistic, you're either with us or against us. You're either friend or foe. And, and that's sort of a very, very combative language. And that's still very widespread in, in many businesses around the world. You know, um, slightly more nuanced, it's a battle for, for survival and winners and losers. You know, some people win, some people lose. And that's right and proper and appropriate. Um, and it's the hunter and the hunted, the predator and the prey. Uh, there are lots of versions of this narrative, still yeah. very common. Um, and in fact, um, you know, there was a, a, a really, really interesting article uh, out about this uh, hunter and hunted and this view of business, um, uh, you know, and the way of the world, and that's how it is. And activist investors, you know, the hunter is the activist invested and the prey is when they take the hostile takeover bid. And so... In the hostile takeover bid, you've got to take out the competition or kill the competition um, and take everything you can, get everything you can, get an advantage. It's all of that type of languaging, um, uh, what you might call excessive individualism that's ultimately you know, unhelpful, I think. Um, uh, going back to, again, Gordon Gre Gecko you know, in uh, Wall Street, greed is good, you know, and... and uh, the rebel yell of, I want more, more, more. So you can see there are many versions and you hear it reverberate repeatedly in the business world, echoed in the media world in those echo chambers uh, of what's going on. We heard that for the last 30 years or so. Yeah, I mean, it's a common refrain. Um, you know, we've got to leverage our competitive advantage uh, and stuff like that. Um, and it goes back, there was a probably the biggest turning point in this whole narrative was in the mid-70s where... Um, you know, companies moved towards uh, aligning the executive cadre with the shareholders um, and motivating them through uh, getting paid by shares, not just company performance. Um, and so I've written in some of the books I've published uh, uh, extensively about how we took a left turn in the mid 70s in relation to all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, putting cash at the front of the entire narrative. Uh, and we saw a very explicit version of this um, 
with a company called 3G, who are basically corporate raiders, activist investors, um, and they'd accumulated a 10 billion fund. Uh, and they took out Burger King, they took out Anheuser Busch, um, they took out Kraft, and then they took out Heinz, and then they merged Kraft and Heinz. Um, and then from the, that platform of Kraft Heinz, they're like that lion pursuing that wildebeest is they attacked Unilever, a company, uh, this is going back in 2017, 2018, a company, Unilever at the time, were three times the size of Kraft Heinz. So it's a bit like that lion and a water buffalo, is the view at Unilever before Kraft Heinz attacked them in a hostile takeover bid was that, uh, you know, 3G, who were the corporate raiders behind uh, Kraft Heinz, they'd have a go at Coca-Cola. So they were sort of like the water buffalo grazing at the water hole thinking, oh, they're not going to come for us. And they did. Um, and there's a really interesting article if people are interested in, you know, that what was called the battle for the soul of capitalism. Because 3G's model was very much this combative cash is king. The only thing that matters here is cash. And companies with purpose, uh, like Unilever, who believe in sustainability and brands with purpose and all those types of things, uh, were considered irrelevant. It, the only thing that matters is money and cash and returns to shareholders. And so there was a battle royale that raged for about a year. Um, and now fortunately, um, you know, Unilever were able to see off Kraft Heinz and Kraft Heinz virtually kind of went backwards massively in their failed takeover bid. The CEO was sacked and so on. But it was that battle for the soul, you know, like what really matters in the corporate world is cash the only thing that matters or is there something else to do with purpose? So I think we're at that sort of tipping point really in what's the narrative in business. Um, and what's interesting in this sort of battle narrative and this combative competitive narrative, it's all predicated on the idea that there isn't enough in the world. So you've got to fight for what you can get. There's not enough to go around. You've got to grab what you can. Um, and it's also predicated uh, on the idea that we're all separate from each other. So I've got to protect my own, you know, hence the sort of ethnocentric stance of many political leaders. So if you take the view uh, of the fact that we're all separate, then it's a very small step to protecting your own and fighting for what you can get for your own. Uh, but if you take a very different view, which is we're all in this together, you know, we're one humanity, we're all on the one planet, you know, COVID certainly doesn't recognize national boundaries. Mm. So who should we be looking after? Then you come up with very different companies and you come up with a very different narrative and a different approach. Um, and so uh, this idea that we've got to keep growing as a single company and we've got to beat the competition. Um, uh, and there's a sort of really bizarre idea in many corporates that will just keep growing and growing and growing despite. So let's put COVID in the rear view minute. Let's get a V bounce back and let's start growing again and acquiring again and mergers and acquisitions. And, uh, but in the natural world, unfettered growth doesn't exist. It can't sustain. It's a non-sustainable model. In fact, unchecked growth is essentially cancer uh, in the natural world. But in how business. do we take that, Alan, in, in, in a sense and use that? I understand what you're saying, but how, how do we shift? How does that work in, in reality? Um, how, how does what work in reality, Katie? Well, how do, how do we move the narrative forward? Um, because we're so, it seems like we're so addicted to this idea that, that we've just got to keep growing. Businesses, we're in, we're in hock to stakeholders and, and investors just want more and more returns, just guaranteeing yeah. more and more returns every year. And we're, we're stuck in that loop in the washing machine. We, we are stuck in that loop, which is, and it, so that's the point of this, this conversation, right, is we need a different narrative. We absolutely need a different narrative. We have to recognise this narrative isn't really serving us. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I think we need a different narrative is because this new narrative that, that, uh, in, uh, that I would like to sort of offer forward it is really rooted in who we are as human beings. So if we take a, a step back for a moment and look at the field of evolutionary biology, all living organisms started uh, on planet Earth as simple single cells, um, you know, single cell bacteria, essentially. Um, and for about a billion years, bacteria would kill each other. So it was classic, this corporate narrative, you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, you know, uh, bacteria carried up killing each other for, for literally a billion years. But after about a billion years of them in this combat narrative, 
you know, it occurred to bacteria, you know, if anything can occur to a bacteria, but it occurred to bacteria in evolutionary terms that it's more energy efficient to collaborate than to kill. So bacteria started collaborating and the collaboration uh, was they'd start to share a bit of their cytoplasmic DNA and they'd put it in a library, a collective library. Uh, and that was the evolution of nucleated cells. So cells developed a nucleus. That was the first huge leap forward in evolutionary biology. But once they all got nucleated, what happened is they all started killing each other again. So the whole cycle kicked off again, and it took a second billion years for the penny to drop a second time for bacteria, if you will, going, do you know what? Actually, collaboration is probably more efficient, more energy efficient than killing. Duh. Uh, and so after a second billion years, the second leap forward was the emergence of multicellular organisms, which gradually evolved uh, over time. And eventually, you know, you get human beings. And this is a, a friend of mine, Elizabeth Saturis, who tells this story better than I can about evolutionary biology. She's one of the world's best evolutionary biology. So basically, it took two billion years for life forms to realize collaboration is better and more effective uh, and more successful, ultimately, than competition. So it's, it has evolutionary roots, this idea that we need to move beyond competitive. And the other thing I'd like to mention, if you look it's at the most... It's going to take us another billion years, Alan. It's not going to take us another billion years, because we're smarter than bacteria, right? But if you look at the two most successful species on the planet, it is human beings and bacteria, right? But what's interesting about that is bacteria took two billion years to realise that. Now, human beings have a neocortex, so hopefully it won't take us two billion years, because... Katie, if it takes us two billion years, we're done for. The climate's going to you know, kill us before that. Um, but the two most successful species on the planet are human beings and bacteria. But if you look at human beings, in terms of the number of cells in the human body, um, they are a one trillion cells in the human body. Um, but actually, if you add in the number of bacterial cells, there are 10 trillion bacterial cells. So we're only really, if you look at the number of human cells in the body, 10% of all the cells in the human body are human cells and 90% of them are bacteria. In fact, there's a very good book called 10% Human. So human beings are actually just bacteria with a human coat, metaphorically speaking. 90% of all the cells in the human body are bacterial cells. And bacteria at the core have learned to collaborate. And human beings at their core, you know, um, are collaborative. So if you look at genetically speaking, um, there are 30,000 human genes. But if you add in the bacterial contribution, there are 3 million bacterial genes. So we're only 1% human in terms of DNA. So there's this sort of interesting sort of ecosystem between human beings and bacteria, you know, and without opening up a whole can of worms about, you know, bacteria and viruses, uh, viral DNA is embedded in bacterial DNA and bacterial DNA is embedded in human DNA. So there's an ecosystem between viruses, bacteria and human. But my point really being is at the core of who we are as human beings, Katie, is collaboration. So we need a new narrative, not least because that is who we are. We are social animals uh, and we succeed as have bacteria because we have realized that collaboration is better than competition. And it took bacteria two billion years to, to do that. And hopefully it won't take us uh, as long as that. So if we take that hypothesis that we need a collaboration, sorry, you're going to say something. No, I was just going to say, I, I really hope I was going to ask you for how long you think it is going to take us um, because that, the, 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 also the clock is ticking. Certainly the clock is ticking. So, uh, yeah. So when I wrote my book on Wicked and Wise, we thought maybe the climate uh, emergency yeah, we've probably got 50 years to reverse, 30 to 50 years to reverse the problem we've created. Uh, most observers think that's somewhere between 10 to 20 years now. So we've got, if we don't take radical action, and I mean radical, a bit like you've seen in COVID with those uh, pictures I showed in the previous webinar with the nitrous oxide levels dropping dramatically around the world when we were all confined to base. Um, we need radical action. If we take radical action, we still have a chance. So we haven't got a billion years for sure. Uh, we may not even have a couple of decades, um, but we've got to take radical action. And that responsibly largely falls to business, not, pol you know, as we discussed, political leadership, busted flush, religious leadership, probably not going to do it, business leadership. 
Um, and a, this whole notion about what business stands for, how business functions, that has to change. Um, so the, the, an interesting question in the way that that changes is we've got to run the global economy differently. And so when you start to engage on the global economy, I often ask people, well, what do you think the best economy? So if we're looking around for how the economy should work, what's the best economy in the world? And depending on where you ask that question, you know, a lot of nation states claim their economy. Um, you know, oh, it's America, it's China, oh, you know, it's, you know, Germany, you know, uh, it's Brazil, it's India, it's somebody. So no, 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 none of those are true. The best economy in the world, in my view, is the human body. And the reason I say that is because it works in beautiful balance and harmony. So what you get in the human body, the liver doesn't try and outcompete the spleen. The lung don't try and dominate the heart. The heart doesn't try and beat and kill off the brain. Now, there are all these different parts to the system, the big complicated system, and they all work in perfect harmony. And when they work in perfect harmony and they collaborate in a way, they produce great art, great culture, great literature. So it's a beautiful metaphor for how the system, how healthy systems should work. And immature systems kill each other. More mature systems find a healthy balance that enable growth and sustainability. So this kind of you, Alan. Not a scan. Well, I, I dream for a body like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, definitely not a scan of me. So Can we've I just got to... take, take a pause one second? I just want, if anybody's got any questions or any thoughts, um, please do put them in the, the Q&A or the chat box and, um, and I, will, uh, I will share those with, with Alan. Um, can I, um, so there's a, there's a comment here, Alan. Um, From is this Peter. A good point to share? Um, yeah. So, so our, pick, sorry, go on, you say, Katie. Our collaborative abilities have spawned exponential technological growth that appears to outstrip our growth in consciousness. That can't end well. How can we help accelerate a shift in consciousness? As a favourite question for you. Great question. So the simple answer to that is wake up and grow up. We have to wake up to the fact that we need a shift in human consciousness. If we don't wake up, we can't grow up. Um, but if we wake up, if COVID helps us realise that we're going about this all wrong, then it's been worthwhile. And, you know, a quarter of a million, half a million deaths will not have been in vain. If COVID is the wake up call for humanity, we might wake up. So what we're talking about today is let's assume that wake up has happened. And maybe the people listening to this uh, webinar, you know, are already awake uh, to, to a greater extent. So then it's uh, how do we grow up? And that's what we're talking about. How do we grow up the narrative? We grow up the narrative between this, from this addiction to money and cash. Uh, and what's sort of in interesting about human, human beings' addiction to cash and money is there's very clear evidence. And, that, you know, here's a few examples, but go on the internet and you find tons and tons of this stuff. Uh, you know, most people realize money can't buy happiness, mainly because money is an exterior thing and happiness is an interior thing. But if you look at the data, um, you know, since $1990... Uh, 50 yeah so depending on who you ask and which survey you look at somewhere between uh, 57,000 and 80,000 US dollars is the average uh, if you've got that much money coming into your household beyond that uh, it doesn't it, happiness doesn't improve uh, life fulfillment in life doesn't improve stress doesn't reduce the richer you get um, and so there's tons and tons of data on this but we still keep chasing the dollar we still want more money more money more stuff um, even though it's not delivering what we're in pursuit of it for, because it can't deliver, it can't deliver. So people need enough money to get to a certain level of uh, security, but beyond that, more money doesn't help. Um, okay. and so, There's a number of questions, Alan, yeah. which um, I'm just going to hold for a moment, because I, I, I think you've got a couple more thoughts couple more slides if I could, and I'm if, keen for yeah. you to get there. Yeah. So if, sorry to, uh, I'm cantering through as quickly as I, as I can, because I think there's a compelling story. So if we recognize that we've got to wake up, that we've got the wrong narrative, or certainly a narrative that worked for a while, but no longer works anymore. Um, and it's not just me recognize, there's loads of people, loads of authors have written about, you know, post-capitalism, you know, when the money runs out, full spectrum economics, caring, economics, circular economy, loads of books out there about triple bottom lining and what happens beyond capitalism, right? A collaborative narrative. We need a new story, Katie. You know, the story we've been telling, the combative me versus you, us versus them, you know, put up a wall, all of that. That's a story from yesteryear. And, and it's not uh, going to help us. It's not going to take us to where we want to go. We need a collaborative narrative. Um, 
you know, where we, you know, if COVID's taught us nothing, you know, some people have noticed we pulled together well in a crisis. Why? Because we become more mature. We drop our ego demands and we realize we're all in this together. And that's why we put, and we had a webinar exactly on that point. You know, we find a shared goal and a shared purpose and we do better. And do you know what? We often feel better when we pull together. Um, you know, and since World War II, you know, Europe has done a lot better uh, when we haven't been in conflict, when we haven't been killing each other and fighting each other. We've actually done better in Europe. Uh, and not least because, as I've already said, we're social animals and collaboration is at the core of who we are. And, and also there's this point about personal development is you can't actually really understand who you are if you live in a cave and you're on your own as a hermit. Ultimately, your development requires relationship. You, need to, you can only really find out the advanced levels of who you are as a human being in relationship to others. Um, and all, going back to the 50s and Bowlby's research on attachment and, and separation, and we did a, uh, a webinar on separation, isolation, loneliness, we act, human beings are social animals. We actually need each other to be healthy. It's as important as food and water and shelter. Um, you know, we need that hug, you know, which is why some people are struggling because all they really want is to hug their, their loved ones and their nearest and dearest, and they can't do that at the moment. So it's actually like food and water. We need that. Um, but ultimately, um, we've got to get a balance between individualism and community, between agency and community. So uh, when we start to recognize the collaborative imperative, that doesn't mean the individual imperative is rejected uh, or deleted. Uh, so as we move to a more collaborative business model, we can still maintain a competitive edge. You know, we can challenge each other in that slightly competitive way to go further, get the best out of each other. So it's not a transcend and exclude, it's a transcend and include. We include that which we transcend. So healthy evolution, you take the good forward with you. So when a child learns to run, they don't lose the ability to walk. You transcend and include the ability to walk in your ability to run. So we can go further and faster. And I actually think that there's plenty of evidence that what is really sustainable is collaboration. Um, and so um, what does that look like in a corporate context? You know, we start to make different things important. For example, UN sustainability goals, you know, sustainable packaging, stuff like that is what we focus on uh, and what we pay attention to changes with the change in the narrative. Um, and I certainly think if we want to emerge smarter, if we want to emerge well from this crisis, we need to be smarter, we need to be wiser, uh, we need to get away from popularism and we need to stop relying on individual experts and we need the rise of the wise. And wisdom, as you know, flows from diversity. The reason diversity is important in business is it gives you, you know, generates more cash if you want to be a hard nose about it. But diversity creates better answers. And so it's not about quotas and, you know, the right number of women in the boardroom. I mean, that's important, of course, but it's really because diversity makes you get you smarter answers and smarter answers will enable you to flourish more. So ultimately, what this looks like in a corporate is, you know, collaborative communities will drive a new way of working at multiple levels. So, for example, we've talked, you know, on a big picture level, you know, a shared purpose for humanity. You know, what's the shared purpose of the global health system that COVID has really stressed? You know, we, we talked before about not having our act together globally across sharing data across global health systems. What's the shared purpose for humanity, for nation states or for organizations? Shared purpose for teams, for individuals. So there's that sort of higher level shared purpose. Now, within an individual company, we've got to, if we're going to collaborate and create a new narrative, we've got to build trust and the relationship between a leader and their team. You know, we've got to improve the quality of bonds between a leadership team and the next level in organization. You know, we've got to look across the whole organization. So this is what a collaborative model looks like in practice. We've got to look at the quality of the relationship between leaders and teams, with the, between the team and the next tier, that, and all the tiers around the whole system. And we mentioned last week about the model for the future, which is already emerging, uh, three-layered network organizations with semi-permeable membranes, where as companies lean down because they're going to have to cost cut because of the crisis of COVID, um, you know, what are they going to do? Well, stop seeing your suppliers as suppliers, start seeing them as partners. 
So you change the nature of the relationship, how you relate to those people outside the organization. And we've even got examples of some of our client base uh, of you know, companies that were going to have to shrink a bit as a result of the hit they've taken during COVID and the economic circumstances. But some of those companies have taken the responsibility to try and set up, you know, there's a certain town where they're literally going to close the factory and everybody in that town work for the one company. But being a responsible organization, they've set up a microeconomic uh, kind of community, lots of individual startups where those people can still survive. So that's what, you know, you know, if everybody's in it together, that's what we do. That's what a collaborative community approach looks like uh, moving forward. So these are the sorts of things there's, that we need to talk about. There's a lot about. there, Alan. Um, what, what in, in essence, because I also want to get to some questions as well, is, is what, what do you want us to take away from, from this? Right. So here's my bento box for those of the a, a bento Very box. Nice. You know, uh, a, a beautiful Japanese little you know, lunch box. Uh, <laughs> so what have I learned and what does it mean for me on you know, tomorrow? Um, we're collaborative by nature. So take that away. It's, it's who we are. We are collaborative. That, that's, it's in our DNA. It's in the bacterial DNA. It's what we are at the core. Um, and also, you know, if we can get over this illusion of separation, you, you know, you and I are not separate. You know, China is not separate from America. Here, and COVID's proven that, you know, what, you know, China gets a cold, America gets a cold, everybody gets a cold. So what's the meaning that we take from the COVID crisis is COVID didn't recognize national boundaries. They're artificial, they're man-made. Um, and they served a purpose, uh, a certain evolution of mankind. But you really have to question how much of a purpose they serve now. And we're already drifting in that direction. You know, there's the UN and the WHO and, you know, the EU and all of these sorts of pan-national organizations. But certainly multinational corporations are at the vanguard of that understanding about a global response. We're one humanity. So we're all on the same team, and that team is humanity. So take that away. Um, and the fact that, you know, collaborative companies over time, you know, you can, of course, you know, kick ass and take names and get a short-term advantage. But over time, collaborative companies and communities do better than those at war and battling. Um, and so we've got to, to Peter's point earlier on, we've got to get better at collaborating. We've got to grow up. Uh, and we're not yet, as Elizabeth Saturus will tell you, we're not great yet. Humanity is not great at relationship. Uh, and we've got to mature and we've got to mature fast. Um, and not least because, you know, my development is dependent on those around me um, and my relationship with them. So my own personal progress is dependent on relationships working around me. And so my final takeaway in the bento box there is it is possible to go beyond this obsession with cash and capital growth. And, and not, it's not an either or. We can still return you know, plenty of cash to the shareholders and the stakeholders and so on. But if we change the narrative from you know, a growth at all costs, you know, grow, 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 and the only thing that matters, and particularly financial growth, and think of it more about development. You know, how do we develop individually, collectively, as a community, as an organization, you know, as a market sector, as a nation state, as a humanity, how do we grow? And in that grow, achieve the balance that you see within one human being. Then if we start changing that narrative and moving in that direction, you know, we have a chance. And, and also we'll, we'll all grow as human beings. We'll all get more from our lives than if we continue on this battle metaphor, uh, which ultimately is a zero sum game. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alan. Um, just a couple of questions off the back of that. Um, Paul and Taki says, just an idea, collaboration and competition are a polarity. Competition mm -hmm. is needed for improvement in the right dosage. Collaboration sounds cosier, though. Yes, it is. So if you think about the predator-prey thing, so in a way, uh, the predator and the prey are collaborating with each other. So what is the role of the predator uh, well, to thin the herd, um, you know, uh, and so the herd need the predator to keep them fit and lean, if you will. Uh, and so they are in a collaboration, like breeding in, breeding out. That's what Paul means by polarities. This isn't an either or game. You actually need both. So what keeps the herd healthy and passing on healthy genes is the predator. Now, so they're in a nice balance with each other. If the predator uh, gets too dominant and starts to take out half the herd, 
and then eats half the herd and becomes, you know, big, fat and bloated themselves, that predator themselves become the prey, right? So actually the herd keeps, as they keep running away from the predator, keeps the predator fit. So the, the herd and the predator are in a nice balance. So they are this polarity. You do need both. So we do need, you know, return on investment. We do need return on capital uh, and all of those things. But we need more than that. We've got to a point of human evolution where we need collaborative models in addition to competitive models. Not either or. So Paul is right. It's a balance between the two. Okay, question from Peter Milligan. Some of us, some of us might be waking up. Do we just focus on our, our own and set a good example? Is there anything else we can be doing to help others to wake up? Yeah, tell the story of your waking up. Um, so I think once you wake up, you're, you know, in the early stages of that, you often feel a compulsion to help others wake up as you suddenly see the world with fresh eyes and you realize what's really going on. And so many people feel a compulsion to help others wake up. But it's not just an I journey. Uh, waking up and growing up is an I phenomena. So I am more awake. I am more mature. That's an I thing, right? But if that's all you do, you know, sit on a cushion meditating on the meaning of, of reality uh, for 40 years and you don't do anything in the world, then you're all I and no it. So uh, the answer has to be uh, to Paul's question, I, we and it. So as I become more mature, uh, you know, more aware, I mean, I don't mean I, but a human being becomes more mature, more aware, you know, there's a compulsion. If you think you care about, you know, uh, you know, who you are, well, who you are is not separate from the person next to you. So you have to help them. Um, and in helping them, they will help you. So if we can raise everybody up, so that goes in from the I to the we, and then if we become more awake, then, then we have to change what we're doing. So it has to be an I, a we, and an it transformation, not just an I transformation. An I transformation will not cut it. So you can have a thousand monks you know, banging a drum and pay, praying for peace. But if they don't take appropriate action in the world, we still have climate-driven disaster. So you need action as well as maturity, as well as stronger relationships, I, we, and it. And that's a point made by, by Chris Jordan as well. He said, uh, we, are, we are awake, but those who did not act like me need to act. Our system is so broken, but our politicians don't listen to us as they're so short term. So what do we do? Well, again, uh, what can I do? So again, it's very easy to point the finger at somebody else. Um, and, and frankly, there's some legitimacy to that because some of these people are not doing a great job. But uh, nevertheless, what can I do? Uh, so I wrote a book about the end of politics, as you know, called Crowdocracy, uh, saying, look, we're not stuck. We are not stuck. Uh, so as we become more mature and more insightful, there are ways around some of the sort of uh, it, you know, broken systems that we've created is we can evolve these systems. So as we become smarter and we start to you know, gang together, so the people who have woken up start to make stronger connections and start to take the action, start to change the political system, start to move beyond democracy. Democracy was brilliant for the planet for about three or 400 years, clearly past its sell-by sell date now. So what's the next stage? Is you get into sociocracy, then you get into holacracy, then you get into crowdocracy. So there are levels beyond this. It's just not enough people have embraced it yet. Uh, so there are answers out there. So what do I do? I knowledge up on what these answers are. And I start connecting with other people who are awake. And we start to come together uh, and, and take action collaboratively in the world, rather than sitting there saying, oh, little old me, I realize the planet's going to hell in the hand basket. What can I do? Nothing. No, no. So that, that, that's to, to Aidan's question. There's, there's the challenge we have is we have a small number of very wealthy and powerful individuals who do very well and will be very reluctant to let go of that system that works well for them. How do we encourage them to loosen their grip? Well, uh, through some of these things I'm talking about is we have to uh, uh, change the narrative in corporations, change the way that corporations work, change our own behavior you know, we live in a very consumptive mindset, you know, consuming more and more and more. And so, you know, maybe through COVID, people have realized we don't need that much. You know, enough is enough. We $57,000 or, or thereabouts, $80,000, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, maybe a bit north of that if you really want to. Um, 
we don't need that much to be happy, fulfilled and content and live a meaningful and useful life. So what are we going to do? So those that are awake can, you know, uh, sort of coalesce and start to create forces of influence because you know, many of these people, there's something in, in business, and certainly I came across this concept in mining, what's called the social license to operate. So many of these companies are only there because we allow them to be there. So if you take the example, there was some time ago, uh, Starbucks, you know, there was a big hoo-ha about Starbucks not paying tax in, in the UK, making millions of pounds and offshoring. And, and by the way, that's a very common uh, strategy in many, they have whole tax departments to avoid paying tax in various countries. Um, and so people thought, well, I've got choice. I'll go to another coffee company. Uh, so Starbucks or any company like that, I'm not picking on, on them per se, cause it's a widespread phenomena, um, only operate because we buy from them because we support them in ways. So people can vote with their feet. They can change. Consumer behavior can change. We can change and we can coalesce and we can start to become activists for a different narrative. We're not helpless. And the more we wise up and say there are different political systems out there that can work better, there are different healthcare systems out there that can work better. So it's really getting a tipping point of people who are activists, who are uh, uh, challenging the status quo in the way that we think about it at the I and the we and the it level. That's what I'm really a call to arms, as it were, uh, for I, we and it change. A quick question. Um, Alan, you mentioned three layered organisations. Um, I got the membranes of companies and suppliers. What's the third? Oh, no. So we're inside a company. Three layers are, uh, and again, this is just based on, you know, we do some network analysis, as you know, Katie, with, with, with our client base. And we go in and say, look, you've got an org chart, but frankly, that's 1910 technology. That's not actually how your company works at all. You just don't realise um, we've got this technology. You ask a few simple questions, takes about five minutes. Everybody fills it in and you'll see how your company is really structured. And it's nothing like your org chart. And so what we saw in doing that, uh, that research and, and doing those, those data sets is companies are already starting to organize themselves differently, way differently than your org chart suggests. And it's really the wisdom of the crowd. So network analysis unlocks the wisdom of the crowd. And so the crowd knows uh, the future is different. And the future is a strategic decision-making, small bunch of people who see the big picture and are setting strategic direction. And then you have a front line uh, who are either market interfacing with the customers or in the factories producing stuff. And then you have an integrating layer that links the strategic sort of brain of the organization to the front line. So those are the three layers. Um, and that's actually how companies are organized. So companies like to pretend they're organized by nationality or geography, uh, by category or service line, but actually they're not. If you look at how they're really networked, they're organized much more strategic layer, integrating layer, frontline layer. There are the three layers. And around that is a sort of semi-permeable membrane with people coming and going. So it's a much more organic model. Now, the crowd has already clocked that in, in the same way as if you look at an anthill, uh, an anthill you know, nobody's actually in charge of an, in an anthill and they build this beautiful anthill cathedral. So there's a sort of collective intelligence that goes on. So if you look at that in, in a modern organization, there is a collective intelligence that has already reshaped for the future that's coming and that's needed. It's just the leaders in those organizations are still operating under the illusion of an org chart. So uh, that's what the three-layered network organization is about. Okay, one more kind of more practical. Is it more difficult to form relationships via Zoom and Teams than face to face? I know you personally have been doing, I've been doing quite a bit, but you've personally spent a lot of time over the last eight weeks on Zoom and Teams. Um, well, if you look at the transmission of information between two human beings, and again, this goes to the point of we are not separate. So, uh, as a physician, uh, one of the most interesting bits of data is. When I, when I was a cardiologist, we used to put electrodes on the chest to pick up the heartbeat. But the heartbeat doesn't stop at the skin. You can actually pick up somebody's heartbeat at least two or three foot off the body. And the only reason you put the electrodes on the skin is it's easier. You need much more expensive equipment to pick up the ECG or EKG three foot off the body. The equipment's much more expensive, much more simple equipment to just put the electrodes on the chest. So we broadcast our ECG out into space. So when we're in each other's physical presence... 
you know, we're experiencing uh, each other in a much richer, fuller way than we are in a Zoom or, or a Teams or a WebEx environment. Um, so that will always be a better way to experience each other. But, you know, um, with modern video conferencing uh, facilities, it's really pretty good even compared to five years ago. So, you know, when we have to, we can batten down the hatches and do a lot of things digitally. But ultimately, we will go back to the physical presence and particularly in organizations for the super complex stuff, for the really subtle, difficult stuff, we need to be in the room with each other. But for an awful lot of the stuff that we were flying around the world for, that can get done over video conference. We don't physically need to fly around and incur the cost and the hotel expenses and all of that uh, and all the lost time traveling. A lot of that stuff you can actually do digitally. But I think for the really super complicated, nuanced stuff, uh, there's no replacement for human beings sitting in the room with each, with other human beings. Mm. I've noticed your wardrobe has changed over the last eight weeks as well. Um, which has been it's just got very hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, uh, I, I'm just kind of noticing the, the, the time here and I, wa I want to kind of launch a poll um, because um, we've, we've had some great success with, with these webinars and uh, we're, as I say we're on the, the ninth one today and we've got the tenth one, we plan to do ten um, and we've got the tenth one um, next week. Um, so we're really just asking you, um, based on, on, on today and based on, I know some of you have been over uh, and seeing the webinars um, virtually every week. So if you found them useful, um, and hopefully you can see that poll, it's now launched, um, what frequency would you like us to run these sessions moving forward? Because that'd be really, really helpful to us. And if you can put in the chat or, or question and answer box um, what sort of topic you'd like to um, uh, hear Alan and, and the rest of the team talk about um, that would be really useful as well because we've really we've really talked around you've talked around a lot of the material that, that we talk about at complete but very much through a, a COVID lens if you like um, so Alan is there anything you want to, to say about this I mean the the poll at the moment seems to be very much like about once every Two weeks. So I'm going to end the polling and share and share that. Yeah. So um, we've got a, po a podcast series called Complete Curiosity, where you know it's just you know, really important for evolution to become curious. Um, so we'll carry on doing the podcasting. But if people have found the webinars helpful, uh, you know, either we can come and do them for you in your organisation, or you know, we can carry on with some of these conversations. But we always intended to do ten of these. Uh, through the, the heat of the crisis of COVID. Um, but if there's an appetite uh, and people want to, you know, uh, go into a bit more detail, I mean, there's, there's some of the unanswered questions here. Um, you know, people want a bit more detail on the mental health stuff or a bit more detail on, frankly, any of the things we discussed over the 10 webinar series, just send us an email or uh, make contact with us. We're more than happy to keep going if people are finding them useful. Yeah, and I think, as I said earlier, the third webinar on, on mental health strategies that work and, and don't work, that's definitely one that's worth going to our website and, and uh, looking at the webinar or the, um, or the podcast on that. So next week, we're going to be talking about the legacy of the crisis. Um, and, and really, it's, a, it's going to be more of an integration, Alan, um, of, of a lot of the issues that you've been talking about. Yeah, anything mm. you want to say about that? Yeah. So, you know, again, trying to pull all the threads together. Um, I mean, the, the global pandemic is super complex. So, you know, how we made sense of, uh, we've talked about lots of different things and being a bit of a polymath, you know, ultimately, it, it, you know, how do you integrate all these different strands and how does that relate to my life and what I do tomorrow? So I'll, I'll try and pull it all together as much as possible uh, and uh, cover some, you know, again, takeaways you know when you've understood if you'd have listened to all 10 you know maybe here's some you know key takeaways from the 10 uh, webinars yeah there's a couple of how do we engage others in our organization to wake up um how do we find the right leaders with a capital l and small l for the future so well be uh, the change katie um <laughs> you know don't wait for somebody else start being the change yourself indeed indeed uh, we've, we've learned that over a number of years and uh it's certainly what we we try and live at complete anyway so mm -hmm. i know we've we've gone a little bit longer today i really appre appreciate everybody um staying with us and all your comments and questions i'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them
but really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us this afternoon. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.